This is our last, uh, one of our last panels for the day. And the obvious, obviously, as the slide says, uh, the Asia opportunity. Um, it, we are very close to Asia, so why not talk about it, obviously. Um, David, um, David Gowdy, Jungle Ventures. Well, uh, by the way, we've got some, some breaking news. He's given up his US citizenship, so he's uh, now available to become an Australian MP, I mm. think. That's right. Uh, which is, a fr frankly, a relief to me. Uh, finally, somebody talented. Um, and um, and uh, so, David, you've been based in Singapore for the last 10 years. Prior to that, you were with uh, Yahoo. You spent 12 years with Yahoo on m and Very experienced. Um, you know, what's some of the, you know, come, give us some of the sort of headline learnings that you've got over, over the last few years dealing in Asia. Uh, never check your bags. Good point. <laughs> it's, it's I, I follow that maxim myself. You know, I, I think the, the biggest takeaway is the, um, the scale of the opportunity that's, uh, that's around the world, particularly in emerging markets. Um, so when I was at Yahoo, the reason we went to Singapore is we built something called the Emerging Markets Group. And out of Singapore, we managed Latin America, Africa, Middle East, Russia, CIS, and uh, India, Southeast Asia, all out of Singapore. It's a huge amount of travel. But I think the takeaway from all that is that there's just such an enormous opportunity to build businesses. And there's the competitive, in, uh, competitive intensity in a lot of these regions. It's much, much less than it is here in the US or it is in China. And so the ability to build uh, really scalable, sizable businesses off not a lot of capital um, is quite large. What do you mean by competitive tensions? Uh, competitive intensity. So, oh, sorry. You know, like uh, I was saying before, we looked at the consumer credit space. Yeah. And in India, I think there was over 3,000 players in the consumer credit space online. Uh, India, there was between 30 and 40. In Southeast Asia, there was three. And so it's just a lot less competitive intensity. And so you can build mm. a lot more scale into a business. David, it's, uh, sorry, Duncan, it's, it's often quite amazing to think about the numbers. I mean, they are literally telephone numbers, aren't they? The US venture capital uh, uh, ecosystem last year was worth $21 billion. And in Asia, it was worth $12 billion. And, in, and it $10 billion of that was China yep. alone. Yep. And you're in Hong Kong, and you must be really see it you know, up close and personal. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I li actually, I live in Hong Kong, but I work in Shenzhen. So, I'm right. in Shenzhen, and we really see a fantastic amount of activity going on there. We have a number of companies come through our program, mm. and then they seek venture capital funding afterwards. A lot of them are from China, and those Chinese teams have a really good time with venture capital that's available there. I mean, it, China is a sort of almost like the death star of, of this the ecosystem in, in the nicest possible yeah, way. <laughs> it's, it's, in it's a non-threatening way. It's in a sort of, it's, it's gravitational in its size, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, it, it Shenzhen, of course, attracts enormous amounts of international people. Um, I was speaking to an Australian startup to th this week while we've been here, who, you know, one partner is, one co-founder is sleeping on the floor of a factory, you know, getting the prototypes out, and one's back here in Australia, Been raising there. money, etc. Is that a common experience? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly how I went there. So in initially, I've been there for 10 years now. I, I went there for a two week trip, just to kind of oversee the final stages of manufacturing. And then you never left. Uh, yeah, basically, yeah. Well, More that was actually 15 years ago, and then I was like back and forth, back and forth for five years, and yeah. I was like, you know what, I don't really have a life in England. I'm going to go and I'm going to go and set up in China, and been there ever since. Right. Yeah. So yeah, you know, there's there's phenomenal opportunity there. There's also a necessity to use it. Like everyone else is using this incredibly fast ecosystem for manufacturing things. If you're not utilizing it, you're going to fall. Right, and it, so yeah, that's it's the mother load. What mm. tell us a little bit more about hacks and how it operates, how it thinks. You know, you know, everyone's very familiar with things like the Y Combinator. It's been covered, you know, to death. But hacks is a little bit less uh, known. Tell us a bit more about it. Yeah, so we're purely hardware focused. Um, we're situated um, predominantly in Shenzhen. We have another office in San Francisco. And um, really, I guess to sum it up, you know, when I went to China for the first time, I made a load of mistakes because there was no one there to help me. It was completely unknown. I was n navigating the factory landscape, trying to get things made. And really, what we're there to do as hacks is to help really interesting and exciting hardware companies to leverage that ecosystem. We provide them with all the tools they require. 30 full-time staff, so a full-stack engineering team. And then, and then we're a VC fund, so we're in, we invest um, capital, first checks only 100K, and then we follow on invest afterwards under our mother brand, SOSV. Do you bump into each other in the ecosystem? 
not not so much. Well, you're Although in we Singapore, right? Yeah. yeah. Today yeah. we oh, have. <laughs> yeah. Although we were just talking because he's you're making a trip to Singapore yeah, yeah, and yeah, looking yeah, at yeah. that as a market. So. I mean, um, w from your perspective, do you do hardware deals yourself? No. No. no you're no. all software. Uh, yeah. Give it, give us a flavor of some of the most recent stuff you've been doing. So you know. Um, there's just in Southeast Asia, it's uh, about 70% of what we do is Southeast Asia. We also invest in India and Australia, New Zealand. But Southeast Asia, there's just a lot of pain points today. So you have a vast majority of people who are unbanked. If you think about Indonesia, it's 300 million population, 10% uh, have a bank account, less than 2% have a credit card. Mm. And so we've invested in businesses that you know, are second derivatives of consumption growth. And so Southeast Asia is the first market in the world where Alibaba and Amazon are going head to head. Uh, that's completely changing customer acquisition costs for a lot of e-commerce players. And so we've been looking at kind of what are all the beneficiaries of overall consumption growth. And consumer credit is a, a great space. We've made some investments there. Uh, really facilitating people to move away from cash on delivery and move towards uh, credit, but away, you know, if they can't get credit from banks. Both of you work in slightly different areas, but um, the, the one common theme is is the sort of multiplicity of, of countries in Asia, um, as uh, you know, just as well as China, but Southeast Asia as well. Um, what's the cross-border? What sort of learnings have you th come 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 across in terms of you know doing cross-border deals? Um, you know, bringing teams in and out from other countries, talent acquisition, things like that. Um, well, for us, you know, we've, we've done some custom research and we've looked at the India market and mm. Southeast Asia. And if you look at the top six major metros in India versus the top six major metros in Southeast Asia, it's actually almost the same population. So 84 million in India, 81 million in Southeast Asia. But the GDP per capita in Southeast Asia is four times the size of India. Much, and much bigger. Much bigger. And right. so, you know, Singapore is like the U.S., and here it's $55,000. KL is 21. But Bangkok is $12,000 GDP per capita. And so for Indian businesses, as they think about expanding from Delhi and Mumbai, you know, do they go to Chennai? Well, a lot are now saying, well, maybe we'll go to Bangkok. Interesting. Because actually Bangkok, there's a lot more disposable income. There's a lot more uh, access to consumption. And so it's just a much bigger monetization Are you market. seeing that happening? We're seeing that happen now. And, and I think that's yeah. partially of the interest for the Chinese. So if you look at GDP per capita in major metros in China, it's thirty, thirty-five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. The country as a whole is about fourteen. So as you get into tier two cities, you know, the trade off to say, well, maybe we should go to Singapore, or maybe we should go to KL or Bangkok versus, you know, staying a, as a domestic business, you know, we can build an international playbook, we can access bigger markets. When did that start happening, that trend? That's all, I think, in the last 18 to 24 months. Very That's interesting. Really Are you saying changing. something similar? Yeah, so actually okay. we have, within SSV, we have two other programs which are specifically looking at cross-border deals. Uh -huh. So that's um, China Accelerator and MOX. Um, MOX is primarily focused at mobile only um, investments and mm -hmm. then China Accelerator, e-commerce platforms, um, you know, fintech, etc. Mm. And uh, again, a lot of what you see is these kind of incredibly fast moving and uh, very quickly growing micro um, climates, which suddenly become incredibly profitable for a, um, a small business that can get immediate market traction versus a kind of really difficult, hard to enter traditional market. How, are how is Australia and uh, New Zealand f uh, interfacing with the scenes that you know? So, so we get great deal flow from Australia. Mm. And kind of three companies in the past year that have been fantastic. Neura, or a headphone which um, basically analyze your hearing profile and then customize the sound directly for you. Mm -hmm. um, did like $2 million in pre-sales already, raised a Series A here in Australia. They ship their product within a year and a half of starting the business, which is just fantastic. And you know, they're was the pre-sale a Kickstarter thing or something? Yeah, it uh, one point six on Kickstarter, and then a right. um, bunch since then. Yeah. Um, but you know, phenomenal team. They're based in Melbourne, and then they've got people kind of like you say the, s the same typology, right? They split half in the Shenzhen factory, mm. half of them in Melbourne, growing the business. Mm -hmm. well, uh, um, see yeah, we're seeing more Aussie businesses come up to mm. Southeast Asia. I think. You know, the panel earlier, Daniel was mentioning, you know, it totally depends on the business, and I 100% agree with that. You know, some businesses can be global from day one. 
Um, some businesses, because of their nature, tend to be more domestic. Some can be more regional. But for the businesses that can be more regional or more global that are looking for geographic expansion, you know, I think Singapore is a great landing pad. You know, the government has done a huge amount of work to try and make it uh, a destination for companies to come and set up. You know, whether it's tax incentives or access to capital markets or you know the consumer base, and so I think it's an interesting location to expand to, and then think about going to the U.S. And if your U.S. expansion doesn't work, then your fallback position is a population of 700 million people, not a population of 20 million people. Right, exactly. So um, and uh, I suppose each of you would pick Sing y Hong Kong. You'd pick Hong Kong, and you'd pick Singapore. Would you? You were going to pick one of the two. But actually, if I was going to do, do hard if I was going to do hardware, I for sure you can't not be in Shenzhen. Or Absolutely, right. yeah. Yeah. I do find it interesting, though. I never thought, because I was trying to do it from London when I first started doing a hardware company. I find it really interesting that, you know, uh, that was back in the days of BlackBerry, and the red light was always flashing whenever I was anywhere, because I was always between three time zones, between London, San Francisco, where we were doing all our sales, London, where our office was, and then Shenzhen, where our manufacturing was. Yeah. And actually, if you look at it, you know, you're, you're just running around the world the whole time. Time zone-wise, Australia's pretty good. It's like mm -hmm. in <laughs> it's in between the two places that you really need to be talking to the really? whole time. So yeah, I'm I'm a bit gutted I missed out on that one. I, would I probably should have had a head office here. That um the um it's I was in Melbourne just as a quick quick overnighter just to um meet a couple of companies and uh, I was hugely impressed at the sort of design community there and the uh, there's a, a real creative huge creative community there. Um, in particular, do you see that as an advantage? You were at IDEO, which is a very design creative uh, consultancy sort of world famous, do you think, are you seeing that, that becoming an advantage that Australia can do? Yeah, a absolutely. So, you know, that was part of my point, which I was probably going to finish. You know, wherever you go, if you're going to go to Shenzhen Short, you're going to be there, but you're not going to get the creative talent there that right. you require for yeah. branding, marketing, etc. Mm -hmm. You need to find that somewhere else. And so, actually, I look, I've got a bunch of friends who work in the creative industry here in Australia, and the talent is phenomenal. Mm. And, you know, those are often overlooked incredibly important parts about your company culture which is you know, the people who are informing the design and, and, the, uh, and the kind of development of the brand, they're integrated into what you should be calling a head office. And, you right. know, and if your head office could be here, I think it's a great opportunity, I really do. Um, Singapore, I, mean, I wanted to turn back to something you said earlier about Singapore uh, d making a lot of effort. Is mm. there, do you f seen, see a lot of competition between centers? Uh, uh, Victoria's doing a lot of reach out, Sydney's doing a lot of reach out, Singapore's doing a lot of reach out, especially on fintech, for instance. Sure. Um, is, um, do, you, do you see each uh, sort of ecosystem playing to its strengths or are they butting up against each other? Well, I think Singapore, because of, you know, it's, it's a small country yeah. and it's tightly controlled. And so I think they are in a unique position to use the breadth of the government to, mm. uh, to dry, try and drive initiatives. And so, you know, whether it's the monetary authority in Singapore that's creating sandboxes and working with startups on regulatory frameworks for blockchain or Bitcoin or P2P lending, um, they're trying to incubate at multiple levels across the ecosystem. You know, they're f on one hand forming, you know, a venture capital ecosystem and incentivizing GPs to create funds, incentivizing LPs to put money into funds, all the way down to helping subsidize uh, startups and give them access to low cost spaces to, to build businesses. I want to come back to that. Um, I want to ask but you. But I think it's also a model. So yeah. and you know, Singapore is largely modeled off of Israel. You know, Israel yeah. did much of that in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. But I think it's also something that other governments can look at and say, well, w you know, within our remit, what can we actually replicate? Yes. I mean, yeah, the Israeli s um, ecosystem was got an, a huge shot in the arm from from government, massive government initiatives uh, initially. Um, y at, um, at Hacks and um, it you've recently uh, well, in the last year, you teamed up with Johnson & Johnson to yep. do a lot more healthcare startups. Yep. You're also doing some uh, stuff with Airbus. Yep. Is, is, is sort of sky's the limit? When's the Mercedes deal? <laughs> Not likely. <laughs> um, you yeah, know, the reason we did that was, you know, there's interesting areas that, you know, we could see there's huge growth potential, but then there's also an incredible amount of market knowledge, which we simply just can't cover. And so... We look for partners, right? And Johnson Johnson, largest healthcare company in the world, mm. absolutely phenomenal to work with. We're just going into the second year working with them. You know, they help us on all aspects of, you know, how does a small, messy startup start to think about itself as offering potentially life-saving data or life-saving yeah. um, uh, outcomes to their technology? Um, what are the different market sectors that Johnson Johnson can 
particularly give information about or give connections to. Um, similarly, we looked at you know this whole notion of um, urban air mobility, so people flying in in Ubers up in the sky, and like mm. you know from a technology perspective, you look at it like that sounds immediately like that's a long way off, but actually it's a lot closer than we think. Yeah. And so you know Airbus were already human carrying drone type. Right. Type yeah. Thing. Exactly. You know, it seems ridiculous until it's not, just like autonomous cars. Mm. And um, you know, so you know, Airbus had already been doing a huge amount of work in the area, and so kind of there was an, al an alliance of interest in that space, and obviously a huge amount of um, help that they could Hasn't bring. Hasn't Airbus to got the um, a partnership with Uber? Ah, uh, was that somebody else? Uh, no, I think no, I think it was a car yeah, maker. I don't know. Uh, we'll have to look that up. Um, you, um, you also you said recently that you were very annoyed oh with God, startups annoyed? applying. Um, you were you were unbelievably. We still get founders applying with generic fitness trackers. Oh yeah. There's little left to do there. You said um, yeah. you're um, you're very annoyed with the people um, you know doing the same thing over and over again. You're much more into uh, robotics um, and much more sort of enterprise yeah. applications. Yeah. So unpack that for me. Well, thanks for broadcasting that actually because that stopped a bunch of those teams applying so we haven't had them since. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> so, oh, fitness trackers, you're welcome. You're, welcome. <laughs> no, no, you're Come definitely back. not welcome. <laughs> no, um, I, think, I think the thing for us was, you know, it, it was interesting, right? You saw a bunch of like rise and sort of quasi fall of, of things like Fitbit. Right. And, and then you still have companies applying to you that have, you know, founders have worked for a really long time on something which basically is not too dissimilar to Fitbit. Right. I'm like, Jesus, really? Um, Another and, uh, Fitbit, yeah, yes. Yeah, and, or a Fitbit 4, a Fitbit 4. Um, and, um, you know, we just looked at the value chain of those companies, the amount of time it takes to get to market, and we're like, you know what, like, there, there really is no opportunity here for you. Fitbit, so but I think, launched at TechCrunch, by the way. Fitbit did, yes. in 2009. Mm. Okay. Yeah, well, there you I'm go. I'm interrupting, carry on. Yeah, no, but, you know, eight years later, and yeah. we're still having companies trying to do that. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, and then, and then you look at the huge amount of value that you have in just the industrial robotics space, like robots doing dirty, dull, dangerous work. Um, it's, not, it's not thieving us of jobs that are valuable. It's mm, doing crappy things that we don't want to be doing. That's a phenomenal amount of um, value there. Um, the same for medical devices, you know, talking about not just kind of helping someone to track how far they've walked, it's about genuinely changing their or saving their lives. Who wouldn't want to invest in that? And apparently also people are making lots of drones which aren't very interesting either. Yeah, yeah, I get in trouble for saying that. But yeah, drones drones was a problem for us because you know there was just this huge influx of consumer technology drones and then yeah. we're looking at the market like everyone's invested in it. There's one huge player unless you're doing something which is going to be taken on by them, it's going to be very difficult to get anywhere. Apparently the US Army was looking into technologies that can take out drones because ISIS yep. was using them a lot. Yeah. Oh, well, so the commercial drone industry is fine. Right. I'm totally down for that. And we, and we have a, a lot of enabling technology for commercial drone and there's lots to unpack still there. Yeah, loads. Yeah, right. Huge amount of value. But for okay. it was consumer drones right. was the, the one that we had some problems oh with. I see. Um, the, um, the, uh, I want to go back to um, something you touched on earlier, um, uh, David, um, about blockchain. Now, um, um, this applies to both of you. I'm quite interested in whether or not you're, you guys are seeing um, blockchain becoming part of the startups that you're dealing with, or the, uh, or part, or tell us more about, for instance, how much it often it, it arises in the ecosystem as a as a subject. Um, I think you know certainly ICOs have been a hot topic yeah. as of late. Um, we have one investment in the crypto space. It's a company called Abra. Uh, they're actually based in Mountain View, though, uh, and they're using uh, Bitcoin and um, those rails for remittance. Mm -hmm. They just closed a new round with Foxconn, which I think is going to take them in an interesting way. But, you know, I think Bitcoin, the applicability of Bitcoin is much more real, I think, in emerging markets mm -hmm. or markets where you have uh, destabilization around central banks and fiat currencies. So if you think about, you know, Argentina or even, you know, China, where there's um, regulations that are in place around currency, the movement of currency or the ability to use currency for for different um, things. I think that there's a lot more applicability for those. And so I think in emerging markets, we're seeing more of that. Mm. Um, but I, I think part of that is also overshadowed by a lot of the ICO mm. uh, kind of hype yeah. that's around at the moment. 
Um, yes, I mean, it's, what yeah. about you? It's a good, yeah, it's a good point. So, like, you know, we, we have a fantastic investment in our portfolio called BitMEX, and they are uh, uh, basically a trading platform for cryptocurrencies. You know, they last month they did thirty billion dollars worth of trades as a startup, and you know they were they were kind of I think you know, their biggest was two billion in a twenty four hour period. Um, so that's effectively people shorting and doing futures on on Bitcoin. Right. You know, it's a phenomenal fintech investment to make, and and then and then you see you know some some a, a load of other ones are kind of tailing off that coming out and starting to emerge. Um, blockchain, on the other hand, is like kind of. One of those awkward words at the moment for me is like people use it a lot. It kind of fits in everywhere. But what are the real applications within the space that I look at? So, sure, in in medical in in the medical device world, yeah, there is. I can do see applications for smart contracts to make sure that you know um, people are keeping things secure. People are keeping information about themselves secure, sharing them in the right way. Things cannot get corrupted. There were a number of um, we had a couple of health startups pitch here and I know some of the judges behind the closed doors were interested in maybe whether or not that might be really the equivalent in, in terms of a blockchain startup doing right. the almost the same thing. Right. Did you, is that something that occurred, occurred to you? I, d I don't know about that one in, in particular, but like, you know, I, I just look at it as I, I'm concerned that people start to use the word blockchain as a way to get funded. Right. Like they in the way they used to say AI. I'm an AI mm. company. Like, are yeah. you really? You're not really. You're just doing some simple machine learning. Is there a, is there a, a marriage between blockchain and hardware that you see happening? Yeah. You said medical devices. Yeah, anything medical devices. Else? Anything to do with um, you know, insurance. Um, and you know, there's a huge amount of hardware you know, sensing just on property insurance or on, on, on general health insurance, which can then utilize blockchain. Um. I think the other powerful thing too is uh, identity. And so if you think about insurance, if you think about you know, hospitalization, there's so many different things where you're trying to, to figure out identity, KYC, yep. and I think blockchain is going to solve, a, a, um, has a lot to play globally around identity. And so finally, um, talking about Asia pati particularly, where do you see things heading in the next couple of years? There's a lot of strange, a lot of turmoil <laughs> in the West, for instance, we know that uh, um, you know, Trump has really sort of um, changed America in, in, to some extent in terms of how it operates in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Europe has some difficulties of its own um, in terms of Brexit and, you know, and other kinds of populist movements um, creating political turmoil. Um, how, do you, how does Asia fit, and um, Asia PAC, shall we call it that, um, fit into this world? Are there similar kinds of things happening here in that sense, or, or is there... Do you feel like it's kind of like it's your moment or, or what? You know, to I take advantage of all that chaos? Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because, you know, at, at on one hand, if you think about China, so on one hand, you know, the government has probably never been more transparent in terms of one belt, one road and what their strategy yeah, is. But yeah. on the other hand, has never had a consolidation of power so tightly as they have today, particularly over the last few weeks. And so I think... That's quite interesting. I think Southeast Asia as part of Asia is also showing, you know, most countries are growing at five or six percent GDP. Mm. Phenomenal growth. You know, a lot of the long term macro themes that the uh, been underpinning the region are starting to play out. So you have urbanization, uh, you have an emerging middle class, you have strong GDP growth. Um, and so I, I think that's creating quite a, a robust uh, ecosystem mm. and you know it's it's interesting to see you know where Europe goes and where the US goes vis-a-vis -vis the contrast of, of Asia and what's, the it li what's the atmosphere like in Hong Kong given uh, what oh. uh, David was mentioning about, so about Hong China. Kong is a whole, whole different kettle of fish but like um, you know if you think about China I mean y y we're witnessing and we all know it's the rise of the biggest superpower that's ever existed and um, and you know it it, it it trumps America already, um, and we certainly see we certainly see that to continue to grow. And so, what what I find really fascinating about it is a lot of people are worried about the Chinese government because there's so many kind of negative connotations. Yet, if you look at actually what they've achieved, it's the most phenomenal organization in the world. Really incredible. And I kind of have quite a lot of faith in what they're going to do in the future. Um, you look at their policies around climate change. You look at their ability to grow a country and stabilize a country. Mm. It's good to have that kind of thing in charge of the world. Yeah, so it would be difficult if China suddenly became very unstable. You're right. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, we, uh, un instability is something we don't really <laughs> need right now uh, across a number of fronts. Well, um, we're drawing to the close of this panel, so, but uh, I just want to say 
David and Duncan, thank you very much for coming to TechCrunch Battlefield Australia. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks, uh.